Hello, I'm Scott Hayes. I'm the director of music here at All Saints Church in Richmond, Virginia. I'm here to share with you about the pipe organs located here at the church and hopefully help you understand a little bit about how these amazing musical and mechanical instruments function. There are two pipe organs contained in this church, a large Austin organ here behind me in the church from 1967, all built in Hartford, Connecticut, and a small Schlicker organ in the chapel from about the same time built in Buffalo, New York. We'll spend most of our time talking today about the Austin organ, but I'll show you a few aspects of the Schlicker organ in the chapel as well. Let's begin our tour. Our tour begins here at the organ console. Think of this part as you would a computer monitor, keyboard, or mouse. It's the user interface. They are not the computer, but they allow you to operate the computer. The organ console is the same thing. It is not the organ, but an organist can't play the organ without it. The keyboards, the stops, and the buttons all allow you to operate the pipes located remotely. As you can see, there are three keyboards. Amongst organists, these are called manuals. Just like piano keys, there are black notes and white notes. You play these just as you would the piano, and you press a key down to sound a note. However, that's about where the similarities end. Instead of 88 keys, there are only 61 keys on each manual. And it doesn't matter how hard you press these keys, the volume won't change. That's controlled by the voicing of the pipes and the placement of the pipes themselves. Instead of being directly connected to the pipes or the strings in the piano's case, the keyboards on this organ are also connected electrically. On the back of each key is a system of electrical contactors through which a complex system of wires, magnets, and pneumatics allows wind to pass through the pipes. More on this as we go on. Why does an organ need three keyboards instead of just one? Well, each one of these keyboards or manuals has a different use, which we'll explore as we go through the organ. However, for now, a simple way to think about it is that they allow you to set up different schemes for each keyboard. For instance, you can put a softer accompaniment sound on one keyboard, such as this. With a louder sound on a different keyboard, so something like this. Another scheme might be to vary volumes. So, for instance, you might have the softest part along these lines here, and then you come down here to add more. And then you can go here to even add more. Most pipe organs have pedals. Think of these as a keyboard for your feet. There obviously aren't as many notes here as in the manual's keys. Since you're playing these notes with your feet, not just your individual toes, the keys have to be larger, and so they take up more room. Most pipe organs have 32 pedal keys. The pedals are often thought of as controlling the base of the organ, and indeed, they do control the largest pipes, such as these. However, it's really just another keyboard, so it can do its own stuff higher up in the compass as well. You've probably noticed a plethora of buttons and other controls. The most important of these are the stop controls which comprise most of these white stop tabs above the keyboards. Note that they all have different names, Principal, Borden, Gemshorn, etc. This organ has 59 sets of pipes, and they all have at least one on switch. These stop controls can be operated a few different ways, and the obvious way is to move them just up and down.
on all but the smallest instruments, presets, or pistons in organ parlance, help an organist make quick changes. That's where the other buttons come into play. Some control just a section of stops, such as these controlling only the great vision stops. Others control the entire organ. All stop tabs are moving. Down by the pedals, there are more buttons controlled by your feet. They basically do the same thing that the pistons on the manuals do. The computer in this organ was installed in the early 2000s, replacing a mechanical system. The computer also allows each piston to be set 99 different ways by hitting this button. And this is a huge time saver when multiple organists are using an instrument for different events or different pieces of music. Additionally, there are three pedals just above the pedal keys. Two control the louvers in front of one group of pipes, allowing the organist to have some control over the volume of the pipes contained in the box. Now that you've seen the user interface here at the console, let's explore some of the sounds of the organ. An organ creates sounds almost entirely through blowing wind through a pipe. Each pipe does exactly one thing. It plays one pitch, sounding the same each time it plays. It never changes, the volume is, never, is always the same, and it always sounds how it was determined by the voicer and the design of the pipes. That's why we have so many pipes. To make up a complete stop, you have to have 61 of these. To create different effects, you use them in different combinations. For instance, here is the equivalent on the big organ of the same set of pipes. To create different effects other than just you would add the same stop, maybe nothing off. Each one of these notes that I hit right now, there are eight pipes playing. Additionally, you may have noticed a bunch of numbers on each stop. These refer to the speaking length of the longest pipe in the stop. On this particular stop, the eight foot principle, the lowest pipe is approximately eight foot long. Eight foot pitch matches up with the pitch of a piano. If you play middle C on an eight foot stop, it'll same, sound the same pitch as it does on the piano. The other numbers mostly double or half. A 16 foot stop would play an octave below the eight foot stop. So here's the eight foot stop, and the 16 foot stop. Or a four foot stop would play an octave above. Here's the eight foot stop, and here's the four foot stop. I'm hitting the same key each time. On this instrument, we have stops at 32 foot, 16 foot, eight foot, four foot, and two foot unison pitches. Additionally, there are other stops with fractions that might play, say, this. Notice that it's not playing a C, it's playing a G. And this allows interesting combinations such as this. A nice little solo combination, creating interesting colors. They're never or rarely used alone. Finally, there are stops with Roman numerals. The numeral refers to the number of pipes playing for each node. For instance, we have one with the numeral four. This means there are four pipes playing for each note of the keyboard. These stops are often the brightest of the organ, producing the highest pitches and adding a shimmering color to the overall sound of the combination. So here's the stop by itself. Not particularly useful. 
But when you add it, say, to this combination, it creates this effect. Think of each stop as a different instrument in an orchestra. The different stops make different sounds or effects depending on how the pipes are made and designed. If we look here, we have four pipes from different stops. They all play the same pitch. Here's a principal stop, a flute stop, another flute stop, and a reed stop. Some pipes have a larger diameter. And the principal is much smaller than the flute, but they sound the same pitch. They might be made of a different material, such as the wood stop. Others have reeds and imitate woodwinds or brass. <laughs> In this case, a really funny one. We'll begin our exploration of these sounds with the definitive sound of the pipe organ, the principal. This is the most important stop in any organ. The rest of the instrument is designed and built completely around this stop. The reason is, the principal has a simple quality that lends itself well to leading singing, providing a clear but solid tone that is in sympathy with the human voice. The diameter of a principal pipe tends towards the middle, so it's not too large and not too small, creating a balance of lower and higher harmonics, just like a human voice. Each different manual has different principal stops at a variety of pitches used for different effects. Some are softer, while some are louder. Many pipe organs have more of these than any other stop, and that's true here at All Saints. 33 of our 59 sets of pipes are principles, nearly 56% of the entire organ, and they all have different roles. One important thing that principles do is to create a chorus for the organ. When you combine several principles at varying pitches, you create the sound, which you hear quite often for hymns. And it can be smaller or louder. Pipe organ flutes are the most similar to their orchestral counterparts. Making sound the same way, they basically just blow air through pipe and set a column of air in motion. Through the ages, on the pipe organ, several different colors have emerged. Some pipes might be completely open, such as this, while others are somewhat in between with a bit of a chimney. And still others are wooden and completely closed off, so there's no hole in the top. Each of these factors influence the sound of the pipe. Flute pipes tend to have a very wide diameter, and that reinforces the fundamental harmonic of the pipe itself. As a result, they don't tend to have the clearest pitch until you get further up in the range. Down at the bottom of a set, they might be pretty muddy, Where up top, it's very easy to hear the pitch. Unlike the harmonics of the human voice, a flute pipe is f fundamentally different, so it doesn't blend terribly well. So they tend to be useful for accompanying, like choirs, when you want to set a solo voice apart. Here at All Saints, we have 14 different sets of flute pipes. Now we come to the reed stops. These still use air to make noise, but in a different way. Where the other pipes essentially operate as whistles, these pipes use air to move a brass reed that beats and causes the air to move above it. These imitate woodwind or brass instruments.
And as you can see here, there's this little brass reed right above here that moves. And that's what beats against it. When air passes through, it beats against the other part. And there you go. Reed stops can vary quite a bit and have quite a lot of personality and tend to be the stops that folks remember on any pipe organ. On the woodwind spectrum, we have three stops that imitate antique woodwind instruments. The first is the crumb horn, which is a Renaissance double reed instrument. While the true crumb horn has quite an obnoxious tone, our little crumb horn here at All Saints is quite lovely, especially when it's used with a flue stop to provide a little roundness. Here's the crumb horn by itself. And you add the flute with it. Our second woodwind is the shame, imitating another early double reed instrument. I'll be sure to show you this stop when we tour the organ chamber as it's quite distinct looking. However, it's a sort of oboe type of sound. This one almost sounding more on the English horn type of spectrum. Our other woodwind is the fagato, which is the organ's take on the bassoon. This stop plays an octave below the piano's pitch at 16 foot. The lowest notes sound like this. While higher in the range, it sounds a little bit more like an oboe. The remaining five reed stops all imitate trumpets. Here at All Saints, we have varying volumes of trumpets on this organ, all used in different ways. Our smallest is the swell trumpet, which is used a lot, especially in hymns in combination with the choruses. Our mid-sized trumpet is quite fiery. It is the great trumpet. It is useful for soloing out melodies and hymns, as well as adding excitement as you near full organ. The loudest set of trumpets is actually the newest set of pipes in the organ, the festival trumpet. This set was added about 2005 and provides the triumphant sound used at weddings and other festive occasions. In addition to all of these wind-blown sounds, there are two percussion effects on this organ. The first is a sound retained from the old organ housed downtown in the for with the former church, the chimes. These are just orchestral bells struck by electronically controlled mallets. The second percussion effect is a series of bells that are running, rung in a succession by a motor powered mallet, creating a jingle bells effect called a cymbal stern. Our behind-the-scenes part of this tour begins with a trip to the boiler room, located below the chancel of the church, where the organ blower is housed. The blower for the organ is located here in the basement. As you can hear, it's a bit noisy when it's running, so that's why it's located here. Air filters keep the basement dirt from being sucked in. This blower is original to the organ from 1967 and is run without fail. Wind is pressurized here by large fans and then transferred up several stories to the organ chamber. A few stories up, we come to the acolyte vesting room and this mysterious green door. This door leads to the organ chamber. Let's go in.
the back of the organ is purely functional. Here we see the wind line coming up from the basement, which feeds into these various parts of the organ, including what is called a regulator or a reservoir. These reservoirs determine exactly how much of the pressurized air get into the area below the pipes, which is pretty important. Austin pipe organs have a patented design for their playing mechanism called the universal wind chest. These wind chests allow for a variety of installations, but also for something particularly interesting for this video. We can walk inside part of them, something not possible in most pipe organs. But before we go in, let me orient you a bit. This is the door to the universal wind chest. If we go up these, this ladder, we'll go up on top and you'll see organ pipes through this door. Everything above here pretty much has to do with the playing of the pipes, while everything down below has to do with the mechanism that makes the pipes play at the right time. It's rather tight in here, but we can see exactly how the organ plays. On one side, you see here a magnet and a pneumatic motor with the stop names labeled. These are called stop actions, and when activated, they move a bar up that turns on that stop. This bar runs the entire length of the chest. On the other side of the wind chest, you can see the key pneumatics. On this organ, each key on the keyboard downstairs has a pneumatic in each of the four divisions. In this case, this is low C in the swell division. So if this pneumatic works, low C will play. The bar that goes up, you have the stop action that pulls a wooden stick called a tracker, which then allows two valves to collapse there at the top. And right above those two valves, the two circular valves, is the pipe. We'll move now from the mechanical parts of the organ to the pipes of the organ, and we'll enter first the pedal division. The pedal division is where the largest stops of the organ are found. The largest single pipe in the organ is this here in the corner, the, that of the low 16-foot open diapason, and the wood pipe. Next to it, you see a 16-foot string, the 16-foot gems horn. This is a wonderful stop that provides a great deal of pitch definition. Don't worry, I'm not gonna show you all 59 sets of pipes individually. Out here, a little further towards the church, we have the Great Division. The Great Division has 13 sets of pipes, and these are the loudest sets generally in the organ. We have flutes, principles, strings, and reeds, and these are used to really provide the oomph necessary to carry the church in singing. Now we'll walk a little bit further along in this path here to the pedal division. On my right, as you look through the shades, is the swell division. And here we come to the pedal. It's a tight squeeze right here. Now, the rest of the pedal division, these are the smaller pipes of the pedal division. They're still eight feet tall, but they're not as big as the 16, which are back in the corner. If we travel a little bit further, we've run into one of the great secrets of the Austin organ, and that is these speakers. The speakers on this organ produce only 12 pitches, and that is the bottom of a 32-foot stop. We don't actually have any real 32-foot pipes in this organ, though we produce that pitch electronically through these speakers. It sounds a little bit like a helicopter taking off at times. Now, we can go down this little trap door here to the next part of the tour, which is the continuation of the wind chests that we were inside. So if you go above here, into these things, you'll see much more of the mechanism that makes the pipes play. But back in the corner here, we'll see the electronics for the 32-foot reed, the one electronic part of the organ. And then you can also see little trap doors 
underneath these chests, and that's how you get into the organ for repair. Now we'll move into the swell and positive divisions contained in these boxes with louvers or shades in front of them. They work just like window blinds, but instead of blocking light, they block sound. Here in the swell, we can clearly see all four types of pipes in their natural habitats. Here's the principal stop. Notice how it has open tops, and though it's hard to tell, it is not the largest diameter pipe you see. Behind the principal, here is a flute, the roar flute. It has wooden bases that promote a solid fundamental tone, but further up in its compass, it changes to metal and has slender chimneys on the caps. This chimney helps to accent a particular harmonic partial, in this case, the fifth, which promotes an opaque quality in the sound of the pipe. Behind the roar flute, here is a string, the viol. Notice how it is skinnier than the principal, which helps accent those higher harmonics. Strings often have bridges or beards across their mouths to really help strengthen that quality. On the other side, to my left, you can see various ranks of trumpet stops. These are the reeds again, and how they are employed in here. These are the trumpets, and behind that is the fagato, this very tall 16-foot set. We'll head now to the positive division of the organ, but with a stop along the way, the blower and reservoir for the festival trumpet. This is a sort of mini organ, which shows how wind works in a pipe organ. You can see the small blower, which feeds into a reservoir. Gray wind line conveys the pressurized air to the wind chests above. It has its own winding system because it operates on a much higher pressure than the rest of the organ, and this is needed to produce the powerful sound of the trumpet. As we enter the positive, you'll probably notice that the pipes seem smaller. In many ways, they are, as there is no eight-foot principle in this division. In fact, there are only three eight-foot stops in here, and this division has the lightest effect of any in the instrument. Here, you see the bases of the flauta dolce, the festival trumpet, and the naison flute. There are a few interesting stops in here. The first is this Rorschalmai, which is the one that sounds like the English horn when you're listening to it. But as you can see, it's got an interesting construction. So from the bass, the reed and the tongue are down there. And it travels up this brass column to a resonator that is oddly shaped. And that all has to do with how it makes sound of a certain tone. The second interesting set of pipes in here is the festival trumpet. Which look like a bunch of periscopes. They are what we call hooded, and this allows the sound of the pipes to really sort of be directed out to the room rather than bouncing off the walls in here. As we near the end of the tour of the Austin organ, we'll move to the back of the nave, to the balcony, with the antiphonal organ. This division is actually newer to the organ. It was added in the mid-1990s to help draw the sound of the chancel organ further down the nave to help support congregational singing. In some ways, you can consider this a separate instrument from the front organ. The antiphonal has six sets of pipes, six ranks. All but one of those sets are principles. The one set that is not is this little wooden flute. Why do we need an antiphonal organ? In many churches, 52 ranks is something to be jealous of but we have another six ranks back here, plus the big festival trumpet up front, making 59 ranks. Well, the answer is that this is a very long church. And as a very long church, sound has to bounce around to get where it's going to go. So by the end of this building back here, in the balcony and really the back half of the lower seating in the nave, the organ was rather distant and really couldn't lead congregational singing. The antiphonal was added to help that situation. We've thoroughly explored the Austin organ, but before we go, I'd like to talk a minute about the Chapel Schlicker organ. This little organ has been well-traveled 
It was originally built in the mid-1960s as a teaching organ for Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. And several of the country's famed teachers and recitalists have sat at this very organ. When the large Skinner organ in the chapel at Rollins was under renovation, this organ was moved into the chapel space to accompany their services. Following this, the organ was sold to a private individual in the area, and a few moves ensued. I first ran across the organ in New Wilmington, Pennsylvania, in the kitchen of the local Presbyterian church organist. A good friend of mine in Ohio purchased the organ for his house, and uh, my company reinstalled it in his house after reconditioning the pipes and rewiring the organ. Two years back, he called me and said he was in search for a new home of the organ because he wanted his living room back. You notice that it has many more stops than it does ranks. Each one of the ranks might play at a different pitch, so it might play at 8 foot on this manual, 4 foot in the manual, and maybe at 16 foot in the pedal. The organ has the six ranks, which are all interesting and very distinct, which they have to be in a small organ. So we have the principal. <laughs> add them to, say, this combination, you add them to the combination, it sounds like this. We also have a Baroque reed, which is um, well, not the most useful thing ever. And it has the most comical bottom octave. Well, now you've seen parts of All Saints you didn't know existed and know a little bit about the organs here and how they work. I hope you've enjoyed this tour and know that I'm always available to answer any questions or demonstrate the instruments should you have friends who come into town and want to check them out or um, just want to know more yourself. As always, it's my pleasure.